Well, thank you once again, Pastor Hudson and church family here at Berean. It's a real blessing to be with you today. We've been looking forward to this for some time. As I mentioned this morning, uh, throughout the uh, pandemic, we, since March, we really have not traveled a whole lot. In fact, we had a meeting uh, late February, stretching into early March in British Columbia. We flew back. And uh, that's the first time I actually saw people on board aircraft wearing the masks and uh, long before it was mandated. And mid-March, everything just began to shut down. And so it just kind of cascaded forward. We started to have meetings canceled, pastors called, churches were being limited. Uh, uh, as far as the numbers they could have, a lot of churches went with online services. And you sort of know how all of that went. So in the last four weeks, we've just begun to travel again, uh, gather a little bit of a, a sense of normalcy. And we sure appreciate you as a church family partnering with us uh, through prayer and financial support. That's uh, really precious to us. And, you know, I, I tell folks where we travel, if, if you've picked up one of our prayer cards, if you haven't, by the way, uh, I believe there's still some prayer cards in the missionary uh, rack with prayer cards right at the back of the auditorium. I brought along a little bit of additional literature on some of uh, what we're doing ministry-wise, church planting and so forth. But you don't even have to promise that you pray for us every day. I, I like to tell people, put us in the rotation. You know, there's a lot of missionaries to pray for. And probably what's true is the day that you'd pull our card out of that rotation to pray for us, likely we really need your prayer that day. And I want to thank you for those of you that have prayed for us. It means a lot. We were in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland, early on. And years ago when we planted the church in Mississauga, that church took us on for support. So we came back 20 years later, embarking on a new ministry. And while we stood at our display table on a Sunday evening during that missions conference, a lady came by our table and she handed me an envelope. And she said, when, when you get back to your hotel tonight, she said, I want you to open that and read it. And I, I promised her that I would. And we got back to the hotel, I opened that envelope. And here was a prayer card, 20 years old. And we had three little ones at that time. Now we've just got one great big one left at home. Uh, but that, that prayer card, you know, it was well worn. And the note attached said, Brother Thiessen, I just wanted you to know, we have been praying for your family through these years. And uh, now we're going to retire that prayer card and we picked up a new one of yours. And, you know, it means the world, doesn't it, to have people praying for you. And missionaries really appreciate it. When a missionary says, we need your prayer more than anything else, uh, typically that's, that is true. That is absolutely true. So what are we doing in these days when we're not traveling so much? Church plants uh, have, uh, in a lot of cases, been put on hold. I serve with Baptist Church Planting Ministry. Uh, and so this year of 2020... A lot of uh, church planning projects have been put on hold, put over to 2021. Uh, but I can tell you, that we, there are folks that are still deeply interested in church planting and churches that are committed to that. One of the projects we're working on, I left some information with your pastor, is called 30 by 30. And it's uh, really an, a church planting initiative amongst independent Baptist churches and pastors throughout the Great Lakes region. And our desire is, our goal, if God would allow, is to see 30 independent Baptist churches planted by the year 2030. Now you think, wow, that's, that's a lot. Maybe our faith actually is small. We're talking about all of Ontario, the states of Ohio, Michigan, I believe we need more than 30 churches in the next 10 years. 
if we're going to see our country, if we're really going to reverse the trend of where our country's going? The answer is Bible believing churches just like Berean Baptist Church. So pray for that 30 by 30 uh, initiative and pray that God will uh, raise up young men to plant those churches. Okay? That th those are things that are absolutely critical in this. Mission boards don't plant churches. All right? Church planting ministries don't plant churches. Local churches plant uh, churches. Okay? Under the leadership of their pastor and with the participation of their people. And we can't plant churches unless there's God called men to take those pastorates. So all of that's critical. And we preach it this morning, right? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. So appreciate your prayer along those lines. Appreciate your prayer for us in, in our work with Baptist Missions to Forgotten Peoples. Pray for some of our new missionaries that are just starting out raising support. I mentioned this morning Josiah and Elizabeth Coates. Uh, they're Canadian missionaries going to Quebec to <coughs> serve the Lord there. And it's really uh, difficult for uh, new missionaries right now to get out and really begin their deputation, begin their pre-field ministry. It's tough to get in and raise that support. And so they're going to need, uh, need a lot of prayer. They're going to need uh, to take some steps of faith along the way and see God provide. So I really encourage you to pray for the Coates family. We have new missionaries with BMF Canada now that uh, are in Bible translation. We have uh, a missionary that's applied going to Brazil. So God is still doing some things in our Canadian churches, and I'm excited moving forward. Uh, and we need to see that momentum keep, keep progressing forward. So I appreciate your prayer for us. Uh, and again, thank you, Pastor, for the opportunity to be with you. I know that um, this would have been your missions conference, uh, but this is what God had planned. We, we had something else planned. God had this planned, uh, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it today, and I trust you are as well. I want to invite you, please, if you would, this evening to turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 3. We are going to stay in the Old Testament this evening. And <clears throat> I see that there are a good number of young people here. Young people and a lot of young at heart as well. But really, this is, this is unusual in churches today to see the good number of young people that you have here. Uh, and I hope that you're encouraged by that. Why? Because the young people are our future. They're the hope for the next generation. They're really the hope for this generation. And the message that I have to bring tonight is one that has to do with the Lord's call in our lives. Uh, I really felt impressed this way. I know we touched on it this morning. Uh, and we, we talk about how that we need to pray for laborers. Not only do we need to pray for laborers, but we need to be listening for God's call. We need to be aware of God's call in our lives. Parents, hear, hear me out now. I, I think as parents, we need to be sensitive to the fact that God might be calling our young people. And we, we need to have... Uh, some spiritual discernment about that and awareness of it. And we can help our young people to discern God's call. So we're going to look at the life of Samuel tonight. Now, I know Samuel was not called to be a missionary in the sense that we understand missions today. Samuel was a prophet. But what we have in 1 Samuel chapter 3 is an example of God calling a young person and their response to God's call. And I believe from this story, from this account in the Bible, we can take a great deal to heart. We can take principles that are at work in Samuel's life 
and we can uh, seek to better understand those principles as they relate to you and I and our response to God's call. And so 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse number 1, if you would, and we'll read through to verse number 10 uh, for our text this evening. The title of my message is simply, The Lord is Calling. The Lord is calling. I hope you believe that tonight. God is still calling. And the word says, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep, that the Lord called Samuel. And he answered, Here am I. And he ran unto Eli and said, Here am I, for thou callest me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And he answered, I called not, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. If you can, just underline that verse, verse 7, in your heart and in your mind. We're going to revisit uh, that verse in particular uh, with some special emphasis in a few moments. And the Lord, verse 8, called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Let's unite our hearts together in prayer and ask him to uh, speak specifically to our hearts this evening, shall we? Lord, we thank you for today. It's been a wonderful day, uh, fellowshipping with God's people. And Lord, I thank you for the sweet spirit that is present here at Berean Baptist Church. And Lord, uh, some choice servants of yours that are serving you here in the city of Brantford. And we pray for the ongoing ministry of this church. We pray for the leadership in, in Pastor Hudson and uh, Lord Pastor Taylor and others that um, uh, provide uh, that, that leadership and example here and each and every member that's so vital to this local church. Lord, we pray for uh, this evening that as your word goes forth, it would touch hearts and it would change lives. And Lord, you'd help us to respond as, as uh, you desire tonight. Speak to my heart first, Lord, and then be pleased to speak through me. We give you the glory. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. When it comes to the life of Samuel, Probably one of the most beloved characters in all of the scripture. And what do we know about Samuel? Well, we know that from the start, uh, he was born in answer to prayer. And actually, the family life of his parents, Elkanah and Hannah, was not ideal. You understand that? Uh, Hannah was the second of two wives, and she was childless. And so she begged God for a child. She prayed earnestly. And you remember, she made a vow to the Lord. Lord, you give me a son, and what? I'll give that son back to you. He'll serve you. 
uh, through his life. And so Samuel's birth teaches us a lot about intercession, and it, it, it teaches us a lot about the desire of a mother. It teaches us a lot about prayer. It teaches us a lot about making a vow, committing to that vow, and actually following through. And you know what? Hannah followed through. And so when Samuel was just a young lad, uh, she uh, brought him there to the, to the house of the priest, Eli, and uh, she gave uh, her young son to serve in the ministry of Jehovah God. And all of that is a, is a wonderful thing. But this story is also uh, a, a story with some dark clouds because uh, there, there is the dark cloud of a, of a priesthood that is corrupt. Not only uh, Eli and his complacency, but uh, his son's outright uh, corruption. Uh, days that uh, spiritually were dark. Uh, we'll talk about that in a few moments. And so in, into all of that backdrop comes this innocent and impressionable child whose birth was an answer to his sweet mother's prayer. And we read about the call of Samuel. I said before, I believe God is still calling. God is still calling young people to serve him. God, God called a young man here. Uh, God still has a very deep interest, young people. Whether you're a teenager tonight or maybe you're not yet a teenager, God has a deep interest in the purpose of your life. God designed you wonderfully. And God has gifted you probably beyond what you yet realize you've been gifted with. And God can use you. God is still calling missionaries, church planters, pastors. He is still calling vocational Christian workers. He's calling laborers into his harvest. He is calling people to enlist in the Great Commission. Okay, not just as the lead pastor and church planner, but those that come alongside. You know, Paul said, look, I planted, Apollos watered. But God gave the increase. You know, at the end of the day, we can all partner together in God's work, but realize this, it's still God's work. He might be calling you tonight. Romans 10 verse 14 says, how, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And I know, as I said, God can call us in all different ways. But I believe God's still calling preachers. At the heart of it, it the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pastors, preachers, church planners, missionaries. Pioneers willing to go with the gospel maybe where it's rarely or never gone before. How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Christian laborers are needed more today than ever before. So if we say God is calling and we say amen to that, the next question is, are we really listening? Are we listening? Or do we have selective hearing? Or do we somehow find a way to tune out God's call in our lives? Or is it maybe we're just too distracted by all that's going on in our lives and in the world to really pay attention to God's call. I don't believe for a moment when I read John 3.16, which says, For God so loved the world, that's the whole world, that He gave His only begotten Son. I don't believe 
that God loves our world any less in 2020 than he did in 1812 when he called out an Iram Judson to go to Burma. Than he did in the 1790s when he put the burden on William Carey's heart to go to India. There were one billion people back in those days. There's eight billion in our world today. God loves every one of them. And God says, I need laborers. I need servants. I need someone that's going to hear my call and go. You're familiar probably with the 1040 window. I, I think you support Brent Merwelly, do you, with First Bible? And um, they do a real good job of explaining the need in the 1040 window of our world today and how that 90% of folks living in that 1040 window are unevangelized. Unevangelized, 90%. So 90% of our missionaries, in actual fact, go to about 10% of the world's population and only 10% go to the 90%. There's something wrong with that picture. I'm not criticizing anyone that goes to the 10%, but someone's got to go to the 90%. 85% of those living in the 1040 window are the poorest of the world's poor. Um, interestingly enough, and I believe it's connected, the world religions that dominate in that 1040 window are what? Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. There's a glaring need. There's a tremendous need for the gospel. And while the need is not as glaring in our own country, you know, we, we can drive through cities and towns, little villages, and we see churches. We know there's churches. But I'm telling you what, what what's being preached in those churches? Where is the gospel being proclaimed in its unadulterated uh, clarity. The death, burial, the resurrection of Jesus. If you receive Jesus as your Savior, there's a heaven to gain. But if you reject Him, uh, there's an eternal hell. A place where you'll be forever and eternally separated from God. Where is that preached anymore? And there's a, there, there's a dearth of preaching the truth of the gospel today. We need churches in Canada. We need preachers. We need pastors. Now you might ask tonight, all well, this business of God's calling, why should we listen to you? Well, the truth is you don't have to listen to me. I, I'm nobody. I don't call preachers. I don't commission or send missionaries. I don't even recruit them. That's the Holy Spirit's job. So you don't need to listen to me. But what I'm submitting you to, to you tonight is that if God and His Holy Spirit are speaking to you, then you better be listening. You better be listening. When I was called to preach, Pastor Hudson, I was 22 years of age. Through my teenage years and into my early 20s, I was... I, I grew up on a farm. I was a, a farm boy. Uh, I was introverted. I was one of those kids, you might say, I was afraid of my own shadow. I hated speech class. I mean, hated it. I would rather go out in the hot burning sun and pick rocks for eight hours than get up in front of people for even a couple of minutes. I dreaded it. I mean, it, it, was, it was a great fear of mine. And yet, in 1983, God called me to preach. And it was inescapable. inescapable. I knew that God was calling me to preach. And I remember uh, crawling out of my bed. It was New Year's Eve, 1983. Crawling out of my bed and kneeling down beside my bed after I'd wrestled and wrestled into the wee hours of the morning. And finally I said, okay, Lord. And this is what I told the Lord that night. I said, Lord, if you are calling me to preach, then you're going to have to help me. 
because you know how afraid I am of this. You, you know how little ability I have to do this on my own. God, you need to help me. And I'm here, what is that? You lose track of the years. That's almost 40 years ago. 30, 37. Not quite 37 years ago. And I'm here tonight preaching this book 37 years later, not as a tribute to Brian Teeson. Not to say that, you know, Brian Teeson's been faithful, but to tell you this my God is faithful. And if God calls you, God will, God will enable you. If God calls you, God will provide for you every step of the way. And if God calls you, God will also give you the greatest joy in serving Him. Greater joy than you can find in following your own pursuits in life. So let's look at Samuel's call. Three matters that I want us to consider from Samuel's life tonight. First, Samuel's consciousness of the call. Uh, actually, first, let's look at the, we'll look at the context of his call, then the, his consciousness of that call, and finally, his commitment to that call. What were times like when Samuel was a young man? What kind of a world and society was he born into? Answers to those questions provide us the context of his call. And I can tell you this. The culture was not one conducive to producing spiritual leaders. It was not a society that we would say was a spiritual greenhouse for growing up godly young people. These were the last days of the judges. If you know anything about those days, and you've read the book of Judges, you find this expression twice in the book of Judges. These were the days when every man did that which was right in his own eyes. So, uh, it, it, it was the days of spiritual license. It, it was the days where people were their own self-appointed authority. And consequently, we read a lot of horrific things that happened in the book of Judges. We read things in the book of Judges that were uh, transpiring among God's people, among the Israelites now, that maybe you would think would happen in a pagan nation, not among God's people. And, and maybe the things that were happening were even worse than was happening in the so-called heathen world. And it, it kind of reminds you of some of the days maybe in which we now live. Things were a mess. God's people were a mess. And specifically, the context of Samuel's era was, was a day of failed spiritual leadership. If, if you look just back to chapter 2, You've got your Bible open there in chapter 3, 1 Samuel. Let's come down to verse 12 of chapter 2. It says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not... I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. The spiritual leadership had failed in Eli's day to the point where there was greed and avarice in the priest's own household. Worse yet, 
these boys of Eli were thieves and adulterers, corrupt beyond belief, to where the Bible uses the term sons of Belial for them. Eli himself was spiritually apathetic, lazy, did not even train his own boys to really know the Lord God of Israel. And so he had failed as a leader. He had failed as a father. He did not discipline his own children. Into this comes Samuel. It was also a day of the scarcity and suppression of God's word. You notice the terminology in uh, chapter 3, verse 1. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. Precious means it was scarce. Um, no open vision. A vision, uh, you understand, scripturally speaking, that a vision is not referring to a dream per se, but it's referring to a word from God. And it has the idea, an open vision is to spread out or break forth. So, they had the word of God to be sure, but in ways it was the best kept secret in the land. It kind of reminds you of what Amos the prophet said in Amos 8 and verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, and not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Isaiah said in Isaiah 59, 14, Truth is fallen in the street. That's where we live today. We've got the Word of God. But Berean Baptist Church, aside from COVID restrictions, of course, in the city of Brampton, ought to be packed to the gills with people thirsty and hungry for the Word of God to say, this is what we need. We need, we need this back more than we need the hockey back. Yes. We need this back more than we need our normal dining experience back. We need, a, we need to feast on the Word of God. And so, <laughs> the, the context of Samuel's call, I'm telling you, these were dark days. And I'm not sharing that with you to leave you sort of hanging on a negative note tonight. Because I want you to know that out of the darkness, this is just the nature of our God. Out of the darkness, God brings light. And out of days of despair, God delivers hope. Out of incredible want, God delights in bringing amazing abundance. And so what I really want to say to you at this point, in terms of the call of God, is that the context and the culture of our day is no reason to believe that God has done calling choice servants into His service. It's no reason to give up hope for our generation. It's no reason to think, well, God won't call me. There's nothing I could do. God won't call my children. Listen, in a day of failed spiritual leadership, a day of the suppression of God's truth, Hannah gave to the Lord her very best. She gave her firstborn son. And for all she knew at that time, her only son. But you read the rest of the story, and God blessed her with numerous other children. But she gave Samuel to the Lord. I know it's perilous times in which we live, but that should not discourage us, dissuade us, or have us back off from our belief that God needs us to serve Him today. Let's not stop encouraging our young people to serve God. Have you ever heard of William Borden? William Borden was a young man around the turn from the 19th to the 20th century. He was heir to a multi-million dollar corporation in the U.S., Borden Foods. But William Borden, who upon his graduation from high school, 
was given the gift of a trip around the world by his wealthy parents. As he traveled the world, God broke his heart for the unevangelized and the unreached. And William Borden determined that he would walk away from his family fortune. And he surrendered to serve the Lord in China. But before William Borden ever reached China, you know, he had gone on to Yale and graduated with honors at Yale. Began to prepare himself for missionary service. He was going out as a single missionary. And as a 25-year-old young man, he made it as far as Cairo, Egypt, where he contracted a very serious case of spinal meningitis. And within a month, lying in that hospital bed in Cairo, Egypt, William Borden died. And those that knew the Borden family, those that knew the story, at the time many commented what a terrible waste it was. Was it? Because of William Borden's testimony, and he had penned in his Bible before he died the motto of the French Foreign Legion, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. I believe they say the number was 200 American young people that surrendered to go to China as missionaries because of William Borden's testimony. The context of God's call. The consciousness of God's call is what I want us to consider next. God continues to call. But is the call being recognized? Are we conscious of it? Is it being heard? Is it being obeyed? And if not, why? And we can learn some truths about this from Samuel's recognition of God's call. And there's two main thoughts that I want to leave you with under this. Number one, God's call can be missed. Three times before Samuel responded, so four in total, God called Samuel this night. Three times Samuel missed the call. Three times he ran to Eli, believing the aged priest had called him in the middle of the night. And on the first two occasions, Eli merely sent the boy back to bed. God's call was being missed by Samuel. But is it all Samuel's fault that he missed the call? Look at what verse 7 says. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Samuel had likely been presented to the Lord by his parents once he was weaned, somewhere around the age of three or four years. But Samuel had been in Eli's home for a number of years and was likely around the age of 12, perhaps even a, a young teen by this time. And yet, God's word has not yet been made known to him. Samuel didn't yet know the Lord? How can that happen in the, in the place where it should happen? Where he should come to know the Lord of all places? Whose fault was that? Not Samuel. The older generation was failing him. And I wonder sometimes, is it when we say we lament that our young people are not surrendering and they're not serving God. Have we showed them the way? Have we helped them to understand that God is still calling young people? Have we ever sat down with our family and say, now look, you have a bright future and you can do whatever you want with your life, but we want you to know, as your mother and father, that it would thrill our hearts if you chose to serve God with your life on the mission field, if you chose to surrender to preach, that would thrill our heart. Have we ever let them know that? Do we share with them principles from God's Word that will help them get to know God better? Do we understand uh, what God's call is all about? It could be 
that our children are missing the call because they need a little more guidance from our generation. God's call can be missed. But while God's call can be missed, here's what we need to understand as well. God's call is not easily dismissed. So God's call came to the young man Samuel once. It came again. It came a third time. Still, God was not done calling. A fourth call before Samuel responded. Can you imagine what was going on there at Eli's home that night? I mean, the, 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 the young man, Samuel, and the old man, nobody got any sleep. Samuel was up all those times, and he heard the voice of the Lord. He thought Eli called him. Eli sent him packing back to bed every time. But God was persistent. And the fourth time it says God came as at other times, and he stood, and he called, Samuel, Samuel. Listen carefully to this. When God calls, he does not change his mind. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. So if God is calling you, young person, tonight, this is what I would say. You can try and ignore it. You can put your hands over your ears. You can run away and hide. But God's going to continue to call. God's call is not easily dismissed. We read about a wayward prophet that tried that. Jonah, by name. He ran from God. He said, God, you're calling me to go preach in Nineveh? I'm going in the complete opposite direction. How'd that go for Jonah? How'd that work out? Not very well. Okay? He ended up in the midst of a storm. He ended up getting thrown overboard. He ended up being swallowed by this big old fish. Lived there, camped out for three days and three nights. And finally got vomited back up onto dry land. That didn't work out very well, did it? And I'm telling you what. If God has called you... And I believe God is calling young people today still. You will not be happy until you surrender. You can't be happy doing anything else. God's call is persistent. So don't exchange obedience for a life of misery. It's not worth it. It's just not worth it. There's joy in serving Jesus. There's the consciousness of the call, and finally there's the commitment to the call tonight. 1 Samuel 3 and 9 and 10 says, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place, and the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Now, we'll get to some of the significance of those expressions in just a moment and why I can say to you with absolute certainty tonight that Samuel was committed. Even as a young man, he was committed to God's call. How do we know that? We'll look at that in a moment. But let me say that commitment in our society is not, by and large, held up as a, much of a virtue today. There's not much commitment in marriage. There's not commitment uh, many times in friendship. There's just very little commitment to go around. Much less commitment to the Lord. And a commitment to God's call means a couple of things. It means that when he speaks, we listen. My dad used to say it this way. When I say jump, you ask how high. <laughs> In other words, you don't, you don't have to understand what I'm asking you to do. You just need to obey it. You need to be committed to what I'm asking you to do. Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. In human conversation, some folks like to do all the talking. The Bible says that we are to be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. Someone said, God gave you two ears and one mouth. 
probably a good idea to use them in that proportion. Do a little more listening than you do talking. And you know what? We need to listen to what God is saying. And in our relationship with God tonight, I think we can be guilty of doing a lot more talking than we do listening. Now, it may not be just verbal noise. Some of us have a noisy soul. I mean, we have allowed our thoughts and emotions, our anxious concerns, to grip us to the point that we can't hear God speaking to us. Could be some emotion like anger, unrest, bitterness in our life. And I would say to you, it's hard to tune in heaven's message when your life is full of earthly static. The psalmist said, be still and know that I'm God. Let God do the talking. Hey, you, you might be surprised what he's saying to you. The listening ear, of course, has to be disciplined to hear. We know this from having children, you that are parents. A child does not just naturally listen well to their parents. They don't come pre-programmed to do that. But we develop hearing as we grow, the art of listening. And spiritual listening is the same way. So we need to learn to turn, tune out and turn off the voice of the world, the voice of distraction, and tune into what God is saying. We listen, He speaks. We serve and let Him lead. Speak for your servant is listening. Speak for thy servant heareth. This, this Hebrew rendering would be, speak for your servant is listening with interest and the intention of obeying. That's the attitude God desires in our life. I've, I've had experiences as a parent where I've given a child a chore. I won't give any names, but I've a child in my household. I've given them a chore. I thought they heard. I'm sure they understood. And yet I come back with a, lot of reason, a reasonable amount of time elapsed, and the chore hasn't been completed. And so... What am I supposed to do? So I repeat the command. And what does the child do? They protest. I know, I know, I know. And I've had to say, you know what? I'm not interested in how much you know. At this point, I'm only interested in one thing. Have you done it? Have you done it? And so that's the kind of listening we need to do. That's the kind of knowledge that we need to have about God. Say, oh yeah, I know what God wants me to do. Well, then why haven't you done it? What are you waiting for? When I say that Samuel had a commitment to God's call, why can I say that with confidence? Well, what do we know about Samuel's life? Samuel became known as a man of God. A man of God's word. A great prophet. The last of the judges and a great man of prayer. Verse 19 of chapter 3 says, Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel was a great intercessor and man of prayer. First Samuel 12 and verse 23. When Israel chose a king and God relented and said, okay, you can have a king, but this is the way it's going to be. Samuel came back to Israel and said, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right, right way. Out of the context of spiritual darkness rose a young man by the name of Samuel. Speak, Lord, thy servant hears. And for the decades of his life, he remained committed to that call. He was really one in, in, out of millions. You say, well, you know, I'll, I'll be an oddball to my friends if I serve the Lord. 
People think I'm weird. Let them. It would be much better to be one in millions and be used of God like Samuel. God's calling. Are we listening tonight? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I know, know the hour is, is, is late. I thank you for the diligent attention of the congregation tonight to hear this out. And I pray, Lord, that in the quietness of these moments, and Lord, even after we leave this place, that you'll continue to work in our hearts and lives. And Lord, if it would even mean that just one young person here tonight would say, Lord, I will serve you. Whatever it is you want, God, that's what I want. I may not have all the ability in the world. I'm going to need you to be my helper, but God, I will serve you. I'll go to the mission field if that's what it means. I'll serve you uh, as a pastor, as a preacher. Lord, e e even if one tonight or as a result of tonight, would make that decision and make it all worth it. And so we'll give you the glory, we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.